Welcome to Otautau Connect. This is the message of the week. We pray you'll be blessed by this message. Good, good. I'm so excited about today's message. Um, we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord. And I started off this message, I was like, ah, oh, I have no idea anything. So we're going to go on a bit of a journey together as we sort of unpack, maybe look at a, a little bit about the fear of the Lord. So we'll just pray first and then we'll, we'll get into it. So, Jesus, I thank you so much. You are so good. You are so great. Thank you for your presence that is here. You are here. And Jesus, I just, I just ask that you, you bring a new revelation of who you are to our hearts this morning, that we can go deeper in relationship with you, God. God, we love you. We love you. Help me to speak and help us all to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, we've got to welcome Church Online. Hello. Okay. Um, so, uh, the fear of the Lord, it's kind of a... Like, oh, what is this thing? Fear, love, you know, um, like, so hopefully I might bring a bit of clarity, but probably we'll end up with more questions at the end of this. Um, but, you know, like a lot of things we have about the fear of the Lord is like, oh, is, is it a fear a bad thing? I thought God was love. Is it God, are we meant to be scared of God? But are we meant to be close to God? And does the fear really mean fear? Does it, what, what is this? Uh, or, or is it just a way that people say this to control other people? The fear of the Lord, you know. You know. Um, so hopefully we can get a little bit of clarity, but we're just going to go on a journey together because um, a lot of things aspects of God, it's not just summarized in one sentence, like, ah, this is the fear of the Lord here. No, God, the things of God, it, it's a journey. It's a journey of discovery, and, and God's inviting us on, and it takes a lifetime to discover what God is like and different aspects of God. So this is like maybe a start. This was a start for me to, to learn a little bit about the fear of the Lord. So I'm going to invite you on this journey, and... Um, yeah, we're going to get to know him more, and, and in turn, he will transform our lives. So um, a great place to start looking about things of God is, is the Bible, yeah? Is that a good place to start? All right, that's a good place. I'm glad. So today, we're going to get really Bible nerdy. Who's into to Bible nerdy stuff like Hebrew, Greek words, things? Um, so we're going to get really, really Bible nerdy, and um, we're going to get a little bit of Bible study basics before we begin, okay? Um, because surprisingly, the Bible was not written in American English or even King James English. It was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and it was translated into over well over a thousand languages now. Um, and when we do a word study, it's it's really important that the English translation that we use is closer towards this end, which is word for word end. So down this end of the scale of Bible translations, these are Bible translations, uh, there's ones which are easy to read, down this end, which is paraphrase ones, and there's some which are very clunky and really hard to read because the grammar's a bit like ooh, trying to make Greek and Hebrew grammar fit English grammar, so it's quite hard to to get the hang of that. Um, that's why it's quite, sometimes quite difficult to read those translations. However, when you do word searches, you, it's really difficult. You, you can't do word searches down this end of the, the scale. So you've got things like the message and the passion and these ones, which are paraphrases uh, of, of the original translation, the paraphrase to help us understand in our modern context. The ones down this end are like, this is the Hebrew word, this is the translation, this is the Hebrew word, this is the translation, and then they try and make the English grammar fit around that. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, you know, and then you've got other ones which sit in the middle, like the NIV is a great one that is sort of a balance between the two. Um, uh, and it's actually really important when you are reading scripture to get a range of different 
translations. If you're like, oh, what does this mean? You can, you can look it up in, in the Passion or the Message and see what that interpreter's take is on it. Or, and then you go to like, something like the, the Amplified or the, the, the um, New King James or something down that end and be like, okay, what, are the, what were the words that they used? And guess what? You don't have to buy lots of expensive Bibles. You can do that on the YouVersion Bible app. Who's got the YouVersion? Amazing app. If you don't have it, you should get it. It's free. It's got over 30 translations of the English Bible um, and thousands of languages as well. Really, really cool resource. Um, and so all, you can have a look at that. Um, so it's also online as well, bible.com all there as well. Uh, another uh, resource that is really cool is the Blue Letter Bible. And the Blue Letter Bible is a study Bible. And um, it, is, it is so cool. It is, it is one of my favorite apps. So that's also an app and, and a website. And uh, you, can, you can go on to any verse and you can click on tools next to the thing, and you've got like interlinear things, it's super nerdy, I know, but it's so fun. So you can like look, oh, what's that Greek word? And you can click on that Greek word and it gives you all the things. So we're gonna do a little bit of that today. Um, I've done it for you, but we can, we can go on this journey together. So let's open up the Bible and let scripture interpret scripture for us. So the first time that we see a word in the Bible, the first mention is usually very important for the rest of the thing. It's called the rule of first mention. And um, so the, the first time that the translator, the English translator, translated a Hebrew word into the word fear, so we, we type it in, we do a word search, type in fear. And the first time that it appears is in Genesis 9, verse 2. So, okay, we've got this word fear, right? The very first time we see the word fear in the Bible. And it says, the fear of you, as God talking to Noah and his family, a bit of context, um, the fear of you and the terror will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky. And if we zoom in on that particular word fear that's been translated uh, in English, the, wor the word is mora in the Hebrew. Mora. And so we have um, deer across the road from our house. We have deer, and um, when we, we go for a walk, and if we, we try and get really close, be really still, but if, if Samuel does anything like, oh, look, Papai, the deer just, poof, they're gone, right? They're totally gone. This is Mora. The fear of you and the terror will be on every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky. That's what God said to Noah, and you can see it played out in that. So it's also you, this word is used in conjunction with dread or terror or terribleness. And if we carry on a word search, um, the word only appears 14 times in the Old Testament, and only three times the word is used in context with God and from the context, we can see it's not actually, it's about people who are, uh, who are in, opposed to God. It's, it's always in reference. It's not for New Covenant believers. Does that make sense? Uh, this particular translation of fear is more like terror or dread, and it's something that would make you run like a deer away from, from God. So we can actually cross that off our list. It was a bit of a dead end, um, but we, we, that's not the meaning where it's used in the context of the fear of the Lord, okay? The fear of the Lord is not something that drives us away from him. The next step is to find the phrase fear of the Lord. So we go to our Bible search engine and we type in fear God or fear Lord or fear of the Lord and we see what pops up there. In the, in the, we do an English word study there. And the, the phrase, fear God, first appears with the story of Abraham. When God made a covenant with Abraham and, and saying, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And, and you know, your descendants will be like the stars in the sky and, and, and it will be through his only son, Isaac. But then in the story, 
God asks Abraham to go up on a mountain, take his son, who was probably around 30-something years old, and sacrifice him. This is absolutely outrageous. And, and as a reader of the book of Genesis, you're meant to think, what? Like, this is the promised son that God gave, and now he's the heir, and, and God, wants, God wants Abraham to kill the son? That's so crazy. But Abraham, he, he obeys God, and he, and he takes his son up the hill, and he, and he trusts God. And he tells his son that he would provide, that, that God himself would provide a lamb for the sacrifice. And he puts the wood on the back of his son, the very wood that he would die on. And, and when they get to the top of the hill, and Abraham is about to kill his son, the angel of the Lord stops Abraham and says this, Genesis 22, 12. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for I know that you fear God. I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up in a, as a burnt offering in the place of his son. So this is really interesting. The first mention of the fear of the Lord is in the context where Abraham is in the point where he trusts God the most. He trusts God the most. And, and, and it's in this place of radical obedience an unwavering trust in God to do the impossible, and it's outworked in obedience. Abraham was willing to even sacrifice his promised son. He, he trusted God enough that God would either intervene, provide a substitute, or possibly even raise his son from the dead. I know you fear God. Abraham was called a friend of God. He wasn't scared of God, he was drawn to him. And at that moment, where the, the trust was the like, outwork the most, God said, now I know that you fear me. So this is kind of a crazy thing, right? Like, what is this? The fear of the Lord. To fear God, it's, it's displayed to have unwavering obedience. You know, to say, no matter what, I trust you, God. I fear you. So when God says go, I go. I trust him. When he says speak, I'll speak. If he says give, I'll, I'll give. I trust you. I have faith. Abraham was the father of faith. And I will show you that I trust you and I'll obey you. The fear of the Lord comes from a deep trust in him, and it is outworked by radical obedience. This is what we get from the very first mention of the word fear used in the context of God. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper here. The word used in reference to the fear of the Lord is the word yare in the Hebrew, yare. And the word yare appears actually the first time on page Three in the fall of man. Now, when we did our English word study, it didn't appear because it's translated as the adjective afraid. So God was walking in the garden and he called to the man and he said, where are you? Where are you? And Adam said, I was afraid, yare, I was afraid because I was naked. And in the context that this word is first used here, Adam, was, Adam is talking, he says, I had fear, right? And he uses it in reference to God, and he said that he had yare and it drove him away from God. In shame. Crazy tension. Is that the fear of the Lord? He had fear, and it was towards God's presence being there. 
God didn't say, ah, I know you fear me because you ran away. Now, if we look through the Hebrew Bible uh, and we, we, we click on that word, um, where was it? We, we click on the word fear um, and we, we, have a, we trace it through. So many times God tells us, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Do not yare. Yet when it comes to Abraham, it says, oh, I know that you do. Fear me. So weird. I told you you'd have more questions after this than, uh, than we started. The, the strange thing is, is that the fear that drove Adam away from God in sin and rebellion brought Abraham close to God when he was in faith. What drove Adam away from God in fear brought Abraham close. So we have this strange t- tension. And, and we've actually, the, the word fear, it really means fear. It doesn't mean respect. It doesn't mean, it actually means fear. However, it has to, this fear has to draw us in somehow. And every time that we use the, 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 do the word study of, of yare, this word, it always appears in the context and it's always outworked in obedience. And we don't have time to go into all the references, um, but through, all throughout the Torah and in the law, any time that it's mentioned fear of the Lord, it's always something, someone doing something in obedience to God. So does that mean that we should be scared of God and just do what he says? Just do it because he's big and scary and just do what I say. Yeah, maybe. Well, should we read some descriptions of God and we can make up our own minds? Like, is he a soft, cuddly teddy bear that we can just go to? And No, God is, is actually scary. He's actually super powerful. Have you read what God does to people in the Old Testament who oppose him? It's nuts. This God is, is crazy. He, he's so intense. So intense. We, sh- we should be afraid. We should be very afraid. And we should do what he says. God, he, he spoke the stars and galaxies into being. The energy that was released when God said, let there be light. This is how God is introduced to us on page one of the Bible. The creator of all. By his will, we all exist. The the apostle John uh, saw the risen Jesus in his glory and describes him like this. Revelation 1, 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of mighty waters. In his right hand he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is the risen Jesus. He is powerful. He's powerful. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the ancient of days, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He has the last word. This is Jesus. And and let's look at John's reaction when he saw the risen Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Just out. This is the risen Jesus. 
Ezekiel tries to describe uh, seeing the throne room of God. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. Then Ezekiel goes into this crazy description of these four creatures with eyes and all this stuff. You can read that in your own time. Uh, and, then, and then he says, when the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, their roar like mighty waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like a tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli, which is a metamorphic rock, by the way. And high above the throne was a figure like that of a man. And I saw from what appeared to be his waist up looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And from there down it looked like fire. And a brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. And I heard the voice of the one speaking. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Right? <laughs> Let's read another one. Revelation 4. I was in the spirit and a throne was set there in heaven. One was seated on the throne and the one seated looked like jasper in carnelian stone, a rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne, and around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the, 20, on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with gold crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings of thunder came from the throne, seven fiery torches burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass similar to crystal was also before the throne. And day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the who was, who is, and who is coming. And whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne, worship the one who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne and say, oh, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and because of your will, they exist and were created. This is God, omnipotent, powerful, omniscient. So how are we to relate to this incredible being, the one whose will holds the universe together? How does Jesus teach us to approach this incredible God, our Father, our Father, Abba, like a baby. This God, who is so mighty, wants you and loves you. And he wants to be in relationship with you. He doesn't want you to run away like Adam did in fear, but he wants you to run towards him because he's so awe-inspiring and you just want to find out more about him. When John, encounters the, when John encounters the risen Jesus in Revelation 1, after John falls on his face as though dead, Jesus reaches out his hand and he touches him on the shoulder and he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. What a tension here. And I, I just, I have to use this quote from C.S. Lewis because it just captures this tension so well from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Aslan is a lion. 
the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall be re feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. If I can have the band up just to sing God, you're so good um, again at the end. Because God, he is so good. He's the most frightening, incredible being in which the whole universe exists. But he's good. He is love. It's, it's like the feeling of, of standing at the foot of a majestic mountain. So huge. It's frightening. It's grand. But there's something that, that draws you in to take that step on an adventure. To come, to borrow another quote from C.S. Lewis, further up, further in. And you can stand on his presence like, like standing on the edge of a cliff in fear and wonder and absolute love for him. And you don't have to wonder if he loves you or not. God proved his love for you. Do you remember the story about Abraham taking his son up on the hill to sacrifice him? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. And 2,000 years later, after Abraham said that, the Son of God walked up what could have been the same hill, carrying on his back the wood he would die on. And at the top of the hill, he was nailed to the wood and crucified. And at the top of this hill, we have a choice. Will you put your faith in him? Will you trust in his sacrifice? That he's died for you in your place. That you do not have to fear sin or death, but in the same way as Abraham, fear God. Complete trust and be drawn close to him in deep intimacy and stand in awe of wonder, this incredible power, yet incredible humility and intimacy with you? Or will you be like Adam and let the fear and shame drive you away from God? This is the choice at the top of the mountain. And, and all I can think to do is just worship God. God, you're so good. Will you stand with me? And let's just worship this incredible lover, father, Abba, father. So great, so mighty, yet so in love with you, so in love with you. This was the Otautau Connect message of the week. For more, go to the Otautau Connect website for other inspiring messages. Mm.